Hello, Brazil. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to present to you. I regret not being in Brazil in person and hope to see you all in the near future. Today we will discuss the impact of climate change on human health, both acutely and chronically. I would like to discuss I began my career in cardiovascular disease in interventional cardiology. It never occurred to me in the 1990s that an artery such as this, or a saphenous vein graft such as this, which has a blockage, that this blockage could be attributed to air pollution and heavy metals. Mainly our focus in cardiology has been to re look at blood pressure and cholesterol. But today we know that toxins such as lead, mercury, cadmium, and of course air pollution are leading causes of inflammation, oxidative stress, and therefore cardiovascular disease. We traditionally fix arteries with mechanical interventions such as this coronary stent, and while mechanical interventions may be life-saving and can restore blood flow to the heart muscle, it is important to remember that this is a mechanical fix. It is not a cure for cardiovascular disease. Conventional medicine is very strong in acute care. If someone has an emergency, a trauma, needs a surgery, conventional medicine excels in the ability to bring life-saving treatments, such as the placement of a coronary stent to an individual having a heart attack. However, Western medicine does not prevent disease and manages chronic disease very poorly, simply by the way healthcare practitioners and physicians are trained. In Western medicine, for example, we name a medical illness, whether it's depression, high blood pressure, diabetes, and we apply a pill to it, an ill to the pill treatment plan, which results in people having multiple pills for multiple ills without ever getting to the underlying cause of disease. It is therefore no surprise that the World Health Organization in 2016 reported that 3 in 10 deaths globally are caused by cardiovascular disease and at least 80% of premature deaths from cardiovascular disease could be prevented through healthy diet, physical activity, and avoiding tobacco. Imagine if we had a healthy planet in which we did not have heavy metals leaching into the water supply, mercury in the atmosphere, and air pollution, particularly particulate matter, uh, adding to the disease burden. We now have to think of chronic disease as multifactorial, and the environment is critically important. So whether it's chemical exposures, air pollution, heavy metals, BPA, from plastic bottles, poor diet, how we respond to stress and tension, lack of exercise, drugs, alcohol, emotional trauma, all of these things impact our genetics, turning genes on and genes off. This is the epigenetic pattern. And while we live our life, what we are exposed to, our emotional state, is going to impact our genes and is going to determine whether we become ill or we stay healthy. This is what impacts chronic disease. And when we think about a treatment program for any of our patients, we have to think about the soil in which they live, the foods that they're eating, the air that they're breathing, the toxins that they're exposed to, and so on, so that we can reverse the disease process. This is the official CDC slide for how climate change impacts human health. At the very basic level, increase low-level ozone, 
will increase respiratory disease. As the climate becomes warmer, the mosquito has a longer time to hatch and to live. The result is an increase in vector-borne illness. This includes things like malaria, dengue, fever, West Nile virus, Zika virus, Lyme disease, chikungunya, and so on. Asthma and respiratory illnesses will increase. Air pollution now claims 7 to 8 million lives annually and is recognized by the World Health Organization as the number one cause of stroke and a leading cause of cardiovascular disease. Water quality is intimately connected to human health, with diarrhea-related illnesses claiming millions of lives annually. Diseases such as cholera and leptospirosis, but even heavy rainfall resulting in herbicides and pesticides and heavy metals like arsenic getting into the drinking water will have a profound impact on human health. On an emotional level, fires, flooding, tornadoes, many of which we have seen in the United States as well as all over the world, are resulting in forced migration and emotional stress, anxiety, and depression. We now have to recognize that we are becoming climate refugees and we will see more and more climate refugees as countries such as India, Nepal, and Bangladesh spend time more and more underwater. In fact, last year, 41 million people were displaced because of elevated water levels. Heat-related illness, whether it's in Pakistan in 2015 or in Europe, has claimed thousands of lives. The foods that we eat have a huge impact on climate change and on human health. Gandhi reminds us that the greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be judged by the way its animals are treated. Cave fosses, animal farms, where animals have limited access to out the outdoors, are in an enclosed environment, exposed to fecal waste, in cramped, stressed living quarters, receiving antibiotics and hormones, not eating grass, but eating animal feed frequently made of corn or soy. The livestock industry and methane production results in not only climate change, but the degradation of forests and land, which are CO2 sumps, areas where carbon dioxide can be taken up and removed, are being replaced by land for animals to graze. And this is actually placing us in a crisis. And Brazil in the Amazon has done enormous work in this area to reverse this process. If we look at industrial agriculture, we start to see monocultures eroding biodiversity of plants and animals. We, began to, we begin to see farmers just focusing on growing corn, for example. Heavy inputs go into the land, more pesticides, more fertilizers, which are polluting the soil, the water, and the air. The soil is eroding much faster than it can be replenished and taking with it the land's fertility and its nutrients. In addition, monoculture agriculture results in water being consumed at unsustainable rates. What we have seen in the United States is the industrialized food system 
has not resulted in the production of cheaper healthy foods, but actually in the production of cheaper unhealthy foods with high fructose corn syrup being added to almost every packaged food on the shelf. Carbonated soft drinks, fats and oils, sugar and sweets have all decreased in price as a result of monoculture agriculture. But what we have seen go up in price is fresh fruits and vegetables. So we need to look at from a legal standpoint and from a governmental standpoint, the types of things that we are subsidizing. We know from over 1,400,000 patients studied that the Mediterranean diet has level A evidence for decreasing cardiovascular disease. And yet this Mediterranean diet does not include carbonated soft drinks, sugar and sweets, uh, red meat, and excess amount of dairy products, all of which are being supported by many, by the agricultural industry and industrialized monoculture agriculture. We know beyond a shadow of a doubt that for human health, as well as for planetary health, we need to be eating more plants and less meat. For example, to produce one pound of feedlot beef requires 2,400 gallons of water and about seven pounds of grain. The average American consumes 97 pounds of beef and 273 pounds of meat annually. Even modest reductions in this would reduce the burden that we're currently seeing with methane production on our atmosphere and land use from, an, from animal uh, feedlots. We now know that herbicides such as atrazine, an organic compound uh, which has been used in uh, agriculture is associated with birth defects and menstrual problems when consumed by humans at concentrations below government standards. In addition, when we look at areas that have excess amounts of obesity, the obesity maps overlap with the atrazine use, suggesting that atrazine is also a cause of insulin resistance and obesity, acting as an obesogen. We know that environmental toxins, including persistent organic pollutants, affect mitochondrial function and induce insulin resistance. We now know that cancers are linked to heavy metals, breast cancer linked to cadmium and PCBs, bladder cancer linked to arsenic, cadmium and PCBs. We know that even gout has been linked to lead, osteoporosis to cadmium, cardiovascular disease to vehicle exhaust, to PCBs, to BPA, to naphthalates, to mercury, lead, cadmium, hypertension linked to mercury, lead, and arsenic, stroke being caused by air pollution and vehicle exhaust. So when we look at the most common chronic diseases we see, hypertension, heart disease, gout, osteoporosis, cancers of almost all types, we begin to see a link to environmental toxins. For example, PCB, polybrominated biphenyls, were banned in the U.S. in 1979, but still around uh, certain products that are used by companies such as Monsanto. 
caulking coolants uh, contain PCV, PCVs, uh, and we still see um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, uh, such as uh, what we saw with Love Canal in Lake Michigan. Uh, so this is just the tip of the iceberg. Yet in Western medicine, we continue to think in silos. We continue to uh, not look at the impact of all of the aspects from toxins to food to environment on human health. And as clinicians, we continue to work in silos, uh, each of us within our division, whether it be cardiology, neurology, or rheumatology, not looking at the whole. And the end result is whatever ill we find, uh, we have a pill for uh, that ill. And this model simply does not work and absolutely does not take into consideration the impact of toxins on human health, food on human health, lifestyle on human health. The pharmaceutical industry, for example, uh, depending on the country that one lives in, uh, takes up a good piece of the gross domestic product, the United States being the highest. And if we look at healthcare's carbon footprint, uh, this is from the uh, NHS, you see the second blue column with pharmaceuticals having the largest carbon footprint. So how do we begin uh, to think differently? Because we know that the healthcare sector is ranked second in energy use after the food industry. We know uh, that the healthcare sector results in spending over $9 billion annually on energy costs, that power plant emissions are connected to premature death, as we discussed, bronchitis, asthma, emergency room visits, and so on, and that hospitals, at least in the United States, produce greater than 2.3 million tons per year of garbage and waste. When we look at the big picture and we look at greenhouse gases, for example, and we start to look at how we subsidize, for example, on the lower left side, uh, the U.S. Uh, Farm Bill, subsidies for agriculture and dairy, result in an increase in greenhouse gas emissions and have a profound impact on human health. In turn, the greenhouse gas emissions also have a huge impact on human health, both of which result in the need for more pharmaceutical therapy, which as we have seen, has a huge impact on greenhouse gases. So this becomes a vicious cycle and it's not until we change what we subsidize, change the foods that we eat, and the activities that we participate in that we're going to impact uh, this at all and impact the need for less pharmaceutical therapy. The American Medical Association gets this. They say, more attention needs to be paid to the economic and regulatory policies that encourage the production of unhealthy, non-sustainable food at low financial cost to consumers at the expense of poorer health outcomes that cost far more to treat with medications and procedures than investments in healthy food. Basically, the American Medical Association is saying stop subsidizing and producing cheap, unhealthy food. I believe we are at a tipping point. And the tipping point begins uh, when we all begin to have a voice uh, reminding everyone that we can no longer participate in uh, food industries that are producing healthy food and that we're going to start to uh, do things differently. And the do things differently, I think, was beautifully outlined uh, by the National Health Service of England.
with their wellness route map. They talk about the old road and the new highway, and I think they have it perfectly. The old road has to, that says healthcare should be an institution-led service needs to be replaced by health and social care as part of the community. Instead of just giving the ill to the pill and focusing on uh, treating uh, each disease in a silo as an independent entity, more emphasis needs to be placed on inter intervention and disease prevention. We need to stop just looking at single indicators and out-of-date me measurements. We need a much more meaningful scorecard kept in real time based on community health. We need to be in partnership, patients, community, and healthcare systems. And we need to move from a sickness model waiting for people to break down to the creation of health and well-being. I personally believe that procedures should be there when we need them, but we should focus all of our effort on creating health, not just managing chronic disease. Sustainability should not be an add-on. Sustainability should be embedded in everything that we do, our culture, our practice, and our training. We should look at how we're using our resources and balance our resources to avoid waste and overuse. It is everybody's business within a community to care for the community. And instead of focusing on just having buildings, we need to be focusing on healing environments. If we just look at these simple steps, I believe we have a beautiful roadmap for success. The Academy for Integrative Health and Medicine, an international organization which I am proud to serve as president of and one that I invite everyone to join, is dedicated to exactly that roadmap. We believe that healthcare is about health, not just treating disease, and that health should be available to all. We believe that prevention and health creation is our foundation and mechanical fixes should be there when we need them. Of course, if someone has a heart attack, they should have proper treatment in a cardiac catheterization lab. We believe that all healthcare providers should work collaboratively to heal the entire person, body, mind, and spirit. And we believe that sustainability should be integrated into our culture, our practice, and our training. And it takes a village, not just one organization. It takes the world of health practitioners coming together to bring this vision to fruition. I'm happy to say that the World Health Organization is on board with the World Health Organization's traditional medicine strategy aims to support member states in developing proactive policies and implementing action plans to strengthen the role traditional medicine or indigenous medicine plays in keeping populations healthy. Again, a focus toward health and a focus toward renewal of all of the global healing traditions. And we have to factor in ecological medicine, ego-driven medicine, with one person on top telling everyone what to do simply does not work. We need a new model that's ecologically driven, that recognizes that the planet is our patient and that we are all in this together. The NUCA system of care is an example of a new model. Unhappy with the health care in South Central Alaska, the community moved from a centrally organized, bureaucratic, ego-driven system to a customer ownership and full customer control of the healthcare system. The result, significant reductions in hospital admissions, significant reductions in emergency room admissions, the community participating in their healthcare 
with an employee satisfaction rate of 95%. This is a new model of medicine and health care. It is an internationally recognized model, completely redesigned, and serves as a model for the world. And it embraces the values and needs of the Alaska Native community. Just like the American Medical Association, the American College of Physicians has joined in the dialogue. They state that the healthcare sector, both within the United States and globally, must implement environmentally sustainable and energy efficient practices and prepare for the impacts of climate change to ensure continued operation during periods of elevated patient demand. But it's beyond during periods of elevated patient demand. It should be everyday practice. Sustainability should be embedded into the healthcare thinking, whether it's in transportation, energy efficient operations, waste removal, and the food service. Let's take a look at some superstars in this area. This is the University of Washington Healthy Food Initiative. They increased purchasing of sustainable local organic food. 20% uh, of their produce is now that, 67% of their dairy, 40% of their food is locally sourced. They have uh, proclaimed Meatless Monday with more vegetarian and non-meat protein options and dec to decrease the meat portion size uh, of their meals. The result, greenhouse gas emission reduction decreased by 11.8%, the equivalent emissions of 211 cars, just by purchasing sustainable locally and creating a Meatless Monday. Seattle Children's Hospital's goal was to reduce vehicle traffic by shuttle links to transit hubs, parking changes, encourage carpooling, free transit for employees, and van pool service. They made their whole campus cycling friend friendly. They encouraged the community to walk, to bike. They gave free bikes to employees who pledged to bike to work. They gave cash. They paid those to not drive to work. They put on site a bike maintenance plan, discounts on bike gear, and an in-house bike shop. The Seattle Children's Hospital is already more than halfway to its goal of getting from 50% car commuting to 30%. Drive alone commuting trips by employees are down from 73% in 1995 to 38 percent in 2015 just by making bikes available, incentivizing people to walk, and making transit free. Another terrific group is the Boston Green Ribbon Commission Healthcare Working Group. This includes nearly all major Boston area hospitals. The goal of the commission was 25% drop in greenhouse gas emissions by 2020, 100% by 2050. The hospitals achieved cuts in electricity, natural gas use, greenhouse gas reductions for all fuels. Their sector energy dropped by 9.4% in 2011 to 2015, avoiding greenhouse gas emission equivalents of 126 million miles traveled by an average passenger vehicle. 100% of healthcare energy is from zero emission sources. Boston Medical Center expects to be 92 to 100% carbon neutral by 2018. Cost savings estimated at $15 million, enough to pay for healthcare for about 1,400 patients. What about the food system? The Global Alliance for the Future of Food in 2017 said truly healthy food systems will be built on a more integrated, multifaceted, holistic approach, including nutrition, 
health, happiness, social and cultural indicators interpreted together and in relation to each other within the context of healthy and well-functioning food and agricultural systems. To that end, Fresno has a community food system called the Food Commons. It's a community food system that fosters health, stewardship, equity, and economic development. The system includes farm production, processing, distribution, and retail sales in Fresno, California, and the surrounding San Joaquin Valley. Ironically, this is a breadbasket of food production for the United States, with the people in Fresno frequently not having jobs or money to, or food to eat. The end results with the food commons is that not only do people have work, but they are owners of the land and producing the food that they now sell. The Fresno Food Commons is considered one of the most ambitious regional efforts to reimagine the food system from farm to plate. So at the end of the day, we are all stakeholders, whether we are a policymaker, whether we are a hospital system, an individual, a practitioner, a consumer, or a patient. Healthy people, healthy planet is a win-win situation. We need to move to a holistic ecological health care model. We need to focus on climate justice. What is good for humans is good for the planet, and the planet needs to be seen as our clients. We need to consider plant-based diets. We need to look at the food guidelines, as has been done in Brazil, with a focus on healthier food choices and less meat. We need sustainable food guidelines. We need to phase out or tax sugary beverages. We need to put into place good food purchasing. We need to participate locally. We need to source our food locally. We need to share participatory budgeting. Everyone's input needs to be taken into consideration, and we need to think more of a community-based model, such as the Nuka Healthcare System or the Fresno Food Commons. Ownership does matter, and consumers need to be owners within their common space. We need to focus on fostering health creation, not just treating disease. We need the healthcare system to be focused on climate smart healthcare. As, as consumers, we need to look at our home, our schools, our hospitals, and put zero waste programs into place. We have to remember that the planet is our common home, and we need to look at all that we share and how can we keep our planet and ourselves healthy. We need skills for new operating systems since the old operating system results on an ego-driven model. We need a system that results that is based on ecological principles. Pope Francis said that the economy should not be a mechanism for accumulating goods, but rather the proper administration of our common home. It is an economy where human beings in harmony with nature structure the entire system of production and distribution in such a way that the abilities and needs of each individual find suitable expression in social life. Thank you so much for your attention and for the opportunity to be with you today. I am indeed grateful and a special thank you to the Ministry of Health and to Erisima Benavides uh, for all of the energy and time that have gone into this conference.